Yes, it looks like um, Sir Dennis is on the other mm. on the other platform. Yes, he's here. He's here. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, uh, all of you. In a very special way, uh, I would like to thank Lordship uh, Sir Professor Justice Minister J for uh, spending close to three hours about three days ago uh, with us to give us uh, a complete inside out of uh, Ghanaian land law, uh, which is uh, quite uh, helpful, especially uh, being at an era in which our land law has seen some significant uh, transformation with respect to the enactment of the Land Act uh, uh, at 1036. And I went to him again, uh, asked Oliver Twist, you no, know, Oliver uh, asked for more. So I went to my Lord again, I asked for more, and uh, my Lord has a major uh, engagement and he offered to come again to help with, uh, you know, to help us in the last uh, minute towards your exams on Tuesday. So I'm happy to invite his lordship to speak to us on issues pertaining to constitutional law in Ghana uh, legal system. Uh, my lord, Sir Denis J, uh, please, students. Thank you, my brother, Dr. Ernesto Sudapa. And good afternoon to my dear students. Good afternoon, my Lord. We are discussing mainly constitutional law and aspects of legal system. When we talk about constitution, basically what comes to mind, if you are in this part of the world, you talk about a document containing all important matters which have been codified in one book. That is what we appreciate whenever we hear of the word constitution. But constitution goes beyond written constitution. The one we have in Ghana is, the one we have in Ghana is a written constitution. And when we say that a constitution is a written constitution, what we are saying is that it has been codified into just one book. So if you go to United Kingdom, where they have all the laws scattered in different documents, it is a constitution, but because it is uncodified, it is known as unwritten or uncodified constitution. So constitution, we have written and unwritten. The only difference is that when we say it is written, it is codified in one book. Unwritten, you'll find them in several books or, or statutes, and it is unwritten or uncodified, and it is either written or codified. So Ghana's one, it is a written constitution or codified constitution. And, and constitution is classified based on various considerations. For example, con constitution may be classified based on mode of amendment. So we have amendment and non-amendment. Because in Ghana, for instance, we have various types of amendments. Ghana, we have entrenched, non-entrenched. If you look at our constitution, we have entrenched provisions and non-entrenched provisions. When you talk about non-entrenched provisions, they are provisions in the constitution that may be amended only by parliament only without involving the populace. But when we talk about entrenched, then we need those of 18 and above to take part in the referendum. And even in Ghana, even though we talk about entrenched, unentrenched, or entrenched and enshrined, there is a third aspect, which we call unamended provision. If you go to the transitional provisions, sections 35, 36, 37, I believe that when we say articles, we are talking about the first part of the constitution. At the moment, we mention sections, we are referring to the additional provisions. If you go to the transitional provisions, sections 35, 36, 37, 
cannot be amended by anybody. So if you are classifying that part of the constitution, it will come within the ambit of unamended constitution. It is based on several, whether we have federal, federal as per things in Nigeria or unitary as per things in Ghana. We have several modes of constitution, but today the emphasis is not on the, on the types of constitution. We will start with the um, Article 1, the supremacy theory. In constitution, when we talk about the supremacy theory, what we are seeing is that the constitution is the supreme law on the planet. And there must be a provision who says that, yes, the constitution is the supreme law on the land. Why the constitution being the supreme law on the land? It is the supreme law on the land because of its peculiar features. What are some of the peculiar features of the constitution? Number one, it is the supreme law on the land. Number two, it is the fundamental law on the land. Number three, it is sealed generis. Constitution is sui generis. It is made for a particular country. So Ghana's constitution was made for Ghanaians. Nigerian's constitution was made for Nigerians. So constitution is sui generis. Then when we are interpreting constitution, we say that constitution is a living organism capable of growth. Why do we say that constitution is a living organism capable of growth? Meaning every constitution Constitution when it when it is being interpreted, we look at the meaning at the time the text was created, and the meaning at the time of interpretation. Meaning the meanings can change depending on several factors. The mean, even though the words remain the same, the text, the text do not change, but the meaning will change depending on circumstances. For example, political changes, cultural changes, sociological changes economic changes, they will affect the meanings to be given to the constitution. So when we are interpreting constitution, we say that constitution is a living organism capable of growth. And indeed, it is a living organism capable of growth. So let's look at the supremacy theory. If we look at the preamble, for instance, the preamble to the constitution tells us that the people of Ghana exercise their natural and inalienable right to set up a framework to give to themselves blessings of liberty, equality of opportunity and prosperity to themselves and posterity. Those unborn must also benefit from the constitution. Then the same preamble tells us that the constitution seeks to promote rule of law, fundamental human rights. So these are the objects, the goals that the constitution seeks to achieve. So let's go to Article 1. Article 1 tells us that the people of Ghana, we have come together to promote our welfare and to ensure that we get the maximum welfare under a government. Then we come up with this framework and we provide limits, rights, responsibilities for the governors who are coming to govern us. So we meet, so the constitution is largely made to promote the welfare of the people. And those who are given the authority to, to govern, they have rights and limitations. It is not merely rights. They have rights and limitations. When they are given rights, then a limitation is based on Article 1-2 says that the constitution shall be the supreme law on the land. This is the supremacy theory. When, when we move on to Article, Article 11, we shall discuss them. When we move on, on to Article 11 and we discuss the other sources of law, what we say is that there, there are several laws on the land, but the constitution is supreme. Therefore, any law should not be in conflict with the constitution. So if a law is found to be in conflict with the constitution, it shall be void to the extent of the conflict or the inconsistency. Quite often, when students are, are, are asked, the constitution is supreme by virtue of Article 1 and 
they say yes. It is not true. The Constitution is supreme by virtue of Article 1 cross 2 and not, and not Article 11. The Constitution is supreme by virtue of Article 1 cross 1. Sorry, Article 1 cross 2, who says that the Constitution shall be the supreme law of Ghana. When we move on to Article 11, Article 11 is not arranged in hierarchical order. And Article 11 does not say that the Constitution is the supreme law. It is Article 1 cross 1 of the Constitution, which is that the Constitution shall be the supreme law. So that is the supremacy theory. And Ghana, when we are talking about the supremacy theory, we are referring to Article 1 cross 2 of the Constitution. Now, we know the Constitution. And we are saying that the Constitution is the supreme law on the land. Then we need a referee to guard that where any law is made in conflict with the Constitution, that court shall measure it. That will take us to Article 2. Article 2 has created the Supreme Court. Actually, the Supreme Court was created by Article 126 of the Constitution, not Article 2. Article 126 of the Constitution created the Supreme Court. But Article 2 gives power to the Supreme Court to enforce the Constitution. And when we talk about the enforcement of the Constitution, we combine two provisions, Articles 2 and Articles 120, 130, Articles 2 and Articles 130. When we talk about Article 2, Article 2 will tell us that where a person alleges, where a person is saying that a law is in conflict with the Constitution, then, then that person may go to the Supreme Court. And this one has been settled by several decisions. A J. Chum versus Attorney General. A J. Chum versus Attorney General is one of them. Then um, Sam versus Attorney General. All those cases, they have settled. And even Bimpombuta versus General Legal Council. The law is settled. That Article 2, the word a person there refers to a citizen of Ghana. Why a citizen of Ghana? If you go to the preamble, if you read Article 1, it is Ghanaians who have made their own constitution and not any other person. So when a person is alleging that a law has been made and the law is in conflict with the constitution, or a person is going to enforce a right under the constitution, then that right is available to only Ghanaians. That is why Article 2, the word a person there has been, has been construed to mean a citizen of Ghana. The only locus a person needs to establish when seeking to invoke the interpretative jurisdiction or enforcement jurisdiction of the constitution is to demonstrate that he or she is a Ghanaian, period. It ends there. When we look at articles 2 and 130, the Supreme Court has the power to do two things. You may go for enforcement of the constitution if you are going for enforcement of the constitution, meaning there's a provision in the constitution which needs to be enforced, then any person can go. Then where a person is also alleging that there is an interpretative issue, a part of the constitution are in conflict, or we have, two, we have a provision in the constitution and the parties have put two rival meanings. In that sense, what do you do? you go to the Supreme Court. So when we talk about Articles 2 and 130, here we are talking about two things. You either go for the enforcement jurisdiction of the Supreme Court or the interpretative jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. There are several cases. Initially, the courts were not settled. In Mensa Boateng, in, in, in Oseb Boateng versus uh, Media Commission, Ghana Media Commission, the Supreme Court, the majority held, the Supreme Court under Article 2 could only interpret the constitution and not for enforcement. But the law is now settled that Supreme Court has both enforcement or enforcement or interpretative jurisdiction of the constitution. So let's move on. The same article two, when a Supreme Court makes a declaration, then that declaration must be directed to the person to be obeyed. If the person who, who is directed to obey, fails to obey, that person does not commit contempt. Please, this one is very important. 
whenever a person fails to obey an order of a court of competent jurisdiction, the person commits contempt. But where an order is made under Article 2, then Supreme Court gives directives to be complied with, and that person fails to comply with. That person does not commit contempt, but rather the person commits high crime. High crime means Supreme Court has made an order under Article 2 directing the person to, to act, and that person has failed. So in that sense, that person commits high crime. Then when we move to Article 3, we have to defend the Constitution because we are saying that the, the Constitution is the supreme law. If the Constitution is the supreme law, then we must defend the Constitution. How do we defend the Constitution? Then we must make it a criminal, criminal offense for any person who unlawfully suspend, abrogate, or does anything illegal to the Constitution. So any illegal or unlawful attempt to suppress, abrogate, suspend, part, or a whole of the Constitution is a criminal offense. And what is that criminal offense? It is one of the, ser it is the serious offense on the land. And you commit a high treason. Please, that one, you do not commit treason. You commit a high treason. You commit a high treason under Article 3, Cross 3. That is, if you are bet, if you conspire, if, if, if you prepare, if you commit the main offense against the Constitution, which is the supreme law, then you commit serious offense. And that offense is known as high crime. And high crime is tried by three uh, uh, high treason. It's, commit, it's tried by three high court judges. You commit a high treason. And it is, and it is conducted by three high court judges. And the order for a convict that, that uh, you learned in criminal law, it doesn't apply in order for a convict, order for acquit, meaning I've been tried, I've been acquitted, I've been convicted, and you cannot bring another charge against me. It's not a defense when a charge of a charge of high treason is preferred against somebody. The reason is that where a, a person is charged with high treason, and at the end of the day, other offenses are available upon which the person could be convicted. The law says don't convict apart from high treason. In all other cases, you must acquit the person. And if the person is acquitted, it does not absorb the person from being prosecuted for other offenses. So this is exception to the ultra for acquit, ultra for convict principle that once I've, once I've been tried, the same fact, I've been acquitted or convicted, I cannot be, be rearranged before a court. It does not apply. It is not a defense when we talk about order for our acquit, order for our convict. Then another important area of law that you must know is citizenship. Article 6, citizenship. Who is a citizen of Ghana? Because not long ago, not long ago, when we were discussing who can invoke the enforcement or interpretative jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. We mentioned a citizen. So we must know who is a citizen of Ghana. Who is a citizen of Ghana? The general principles regulating citizenship is that some countries may use birth, birth, place of birth, that is where the, the land on which you were born, the soil, that is juice solely, juice solely. Others will use descent by bread, descent by bread, juice sanguines. And others will also use law to make other people citizens. So citizenship are determined by the land on which you were born, the bread, that is, uh, whether your mother, your father, your grandfather, or grandmother was a, was a citizen. And the third one, a law that has been made to confer citizenship. So citizenship are mainly determined based on these three guidelines. They are determined based on these three guidelines. 
So let's look at Ghana, who is a citizen of Ghana, who is a citizen of Ghana. When we talk about citizenship, it is very, very important and crucial because nobody, nobody is born a stateless. Everybody must belong to a country. Everybody must belong to a country. And we need laws to regulate human beings so that a person may not say that I am stateless. Everybody must belong to a country. So let's look at the laws on the land. When we talk about citizenship, the laws on citizenship in Ghana, we are talking about the constitution, the constitution, the constitution. That is Article 6, 7, 8 through 10. That is citizenship. Then we also talk about the, um, we, we, we talk about the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana Amendment Act, 1996. If you will remember, in 1996, the Constitution was amended by Act 527, by Act 527 to permit dual citizenship. Before the amendment to the Constitution, a citizen of Ghana must owe allegiance only to Ghana, but the amendment to the constitution, that is the constitution of the Republic of Ghana Amend Amendment Act 1996 at 527 introduced dual citizenship. So a Ghanaian may hold dual citizenship. It has its advantages and disadvantages, I mentioned some of them. Then we have the Citizenship Act 2000, we have the Citizenship Act 2000, Act 591, Act 591, Act, Act 591. Then we also have the Citizenship Regressions, Citizenship Regressions, LI 1690, 1690. So let's look at who is a citizen of Ghana, who is a citizen of Ghana. If we look at the constitution, at Article 6 has some up, but it is the Citizenship Act which explains them in detail. Every person who, on the coming into force of this constitution, was a citizen of Ghana, shall continue to be a citizen of Ghana. When a, a person was a, was a Ghanaian, before the coming into force of the constitution, then the person shall continue to be a Ghanaian. How do we determine whether a person was a, was, was a Ghanaian before the coming into force of the constitution? If we look at the Citizenship Act, it uses, Ghana uses landmark, the country uses landmark to confer citizenship. It uses landmark to confer citizenship. Join the meeting. So let's look at it. Persons who were Ghanaians before 6th of March 1957, because 6th of March is a landmark in our history. So that is the first time that we had our own constitution. So if you were a Ghanaian before 6th of March 1957, then on the coming into force of the constitution, on 6th of March 1957, you became a Ghanaian. Then we had the Second Republican Constitution in 1969, 22nd of August 1969. So those who were born after the coming into force of the 1957 Constitution, they became Ghanaians. So if you look at the 1969 Constitution, which is also one of the landmarks, it says that persons born on or after 6th of March 1957, but before 22nd August 1969. So if you were a citizen of Ghana before 6th of March 1957, you, were, you became a citizen of Ghana. But if you were born after 6th of March 
you were a Ghanaian and we needed a landmark to identify them. That is why we say that, but before 22nd of August, 1969, that is from the, from the time that we had our constitution up to the second Republican constitution, if you were born during that time and you were a Ghanaian, then you continue to be a Ghanaian. Then there is a gap between uh, the coming into force of the constitution of 1969, the second Republican constitution and the third Republican constitution. I believe you know that the third, third Republican constitution came into force on 24th September, 1979. So the constitution says that those who were born on or after 22nd of August, 1969 and before 24th September, 1979, they are also Ghanaians because we needed landmark to identify some people. And these are the landmarks. Then after 24th September, 1979, people were born until the 1992 constitution came into force on 7th January, 1993. So they must also be classified or they must also be qualified with landmarks. So it says that persons born on or after 24th September, that is after the third Republican constitution had come into force. And before 7 January, 1993, they are also Ghanaians. Now we have come to the coming into force of the 1992 constitution, which is on 7 January. So if you, if you were born effective 7 January, 1993, then under the constitution, you shall continue to be a Ghanaian if you were a Ghanaian or a parent or was a Ghanaian. And at the time you were born, that parent had not renounced his or her Ghanaian citizenship, then you are a Ghanaian. So that is the first mode of acquisition. That is citizenship by birth. That is, this is an aspect of citizenship by birth. Ghana, when we talk about citizenship by birth, we are talking about two things. The first one is the one I've summed up. Those who were born before 1957, then between 57 and 69, then 69 and 79 and 79 and, and 7 January 1993. They are, if you were born and a parent or grandparent, depending, depending at that particular time, the definition of who was a citizen, then you are a citizen of Ghana. And you and you you are a citizen of Ghana by birth of birth. By birth means either a mother or father, or grandmother or grandfather, depending on the regime, was a Ghanaian. That made you a Ghanaian. Then uh, the second element of citizenship by birth is what we refer to as foundlings. Foundlings. F O U N D L I N G S foundlings. The law is that if a person is seven years or below seven, please, it is not those under seven. The law says seven or under seven. If a person is seven years or under seven years and the person is found on the, on the land, any part of Ghana, that person becomes a Ghanaian. If the person is a Chinese, a Nigerian, once you cannot identify the parents of that person, the parents of that person are unknown and the person has been found in Ghana, then you say that foundlings. So when we talk about citizenship by birth, we are talking about the first one I trace together with foundlings. So by birth includes those whose parents, grandparents, depending on the regime, up to 1993 were Ghanaians, as well as those who were found and they were seven years or under seven whose parents or grandparents are, are unknown. We consider them as citizenship by birth. Now we move to the other one, citizenship by adoption. Citizenship by adoption. When we say citizenship by adoption, it means that somebody has been adopted. The person is not a Ghanaian but has been adopted by a Ghanaian. And therefore the person is becoming a Ghanaian. But there is, there is uh, an explanation. There is an explanation. The law in Ghana 
as provided by the Children's Act, as provided by the Children's Act, at 560, as amended by Act 937, the Children's Act at 560, as amended by the Children's Amendment Act 2016, Act 937, is that only the High Court has the power to grant adoption, to entertain matters on adoption. And what is adoption? Adoption in Ghana means a person who is under 18 is being adopted by a Ghanaian. So the person may be a Togolese, a Nigerian, an Irish, and Ghanaian is adopting that person. If Ghanaian is adopting and the person is under 18, then a Ghanaian can adopt. You can adopt any person under 18 years. But to qualify as a citizen of Ghana, the law is that at the time the Ghanaian adopted that person, that person was under 16 years. Please listen. You can adopt somebody from maybe uh, from the time of birth up to under 18. But the person will not become a Ghanaian automatically. The person automatically becomes a Ghanaian when the person is under 16 years and the person is adopted by a Ghanaian. So if you are of 16 and you are under 18 and you are adopted by, by a Ghanaian, you will not become a Ghanaian unless you register to become a Ghanaian under the laws on the land. So the second, so the third one is adoption. That is children under 16 and not under 18. Even though adoption, you can adopt under 18. To qualify to be a Ghanaian, you must be under 16. That one, it is automatic, automatically granted. Then the other one, we call it citizenship by registration. Citizenship by registration. You are not a Ghanaian. You want to be a Ghanaian. Then you apply to be a Ghanaian. There are conditions that you must fulfill. The Citizenship Act has explained them in detail, but because it is tutorials, I can't spend my time on, on it. So please, when you go read citizenship by registration. Then the other one, we call it, so the registration, it could, it could be married, it could be those who, are, those who have been adopted, but of 16, but are under 18 years. We can adopt, we can register all of them. We can register all of them. Then the other one is citizenship by naturalization. You naturalize, you are not a Ghanaian, and, but uh, you've come to Ghana. You are a person of full age and capacity and you make an application that you have lived in Ghana for a continuous period of 12 months preceding the time that you made the, the application. And you should have lived in Ghana for an aggregate of five years during the seven years preceding the period of the, of the application. Then you must demonstrate that you are a person of good character. Then we need two Ghanaians to certify that indeed you are a person of good character. Then uh, you go through you go through vetting. If it is granted, then you become a citizen of Ghana by naturalization, by naturalization. Then as I mentioned to you that the amendment which was made, the amendment which, which was made permitted dual citizenship. The amendment which was made to the Citizenship Act allowed dual citizenship in Ghana, dual citizenship. Meaning if you are a Ghanaian, you can belong to another country. You can hold uh, Nigerian citizenship in addition to, to Ghana. You can hold Togo, uh, uh, Togo, you can hold South Africa. Our laws permit dual and not multi, dual citizenship and not multi citizenship. So that is Act 527. The Constitution of the Republic of Ghana Amendment Act 1996 at 527 permitted dual citizenship. And we all know that when it comes to dual citizenship, there are positions that you cannot hold. There are positions that you cannot hold. You cannot be a Supreme Court judge. You cannot be an ambassador. You cannot be a high court judge. You cannot be a member of parliament. You cannot 
be any of the service chiefs. That is, you cannot be uh, Inspector General of Police, Commissioner for Customs, Excise and Preventive Service, Director, uh, Controller General Immigration. Then if you are in the Ghana Army, the rank of Colonel and above, and it's equivalent in Navy and Air Force, you cannot. Now, there was this provision, Section 16.2M of Act 591, which permitted, that is the law, has permitted the, um, has permitted parliament to confer or to enlarge the scope of the dual citizenship. Now, parliament also enacted the law and conferred that right on Minister of Interior to exercise. If you will remember, Asari versus Attorney General, Asari versus Attorney General, 2012, one Supreme Court Ghana Law Report, 460. Professor Asari went to the Supreme Court that an agent cannot delegate, uh, delegate a power given to that agent to exercise. The power is given to parliament to determine the scope of public officers who cannot have dual citizenship. So on what basis should parliament grant that power to Minister of Interior under Section 16.2M? So if you read the law, Section 16.2M, you'll find it in the law, but it has been struck out by the, by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional, as unconstitutional. Then if you have dual citizenship, I said that you cannot become a member of parliament. And we have this case, Sumara Biebiel versus Ademu Dramani. Sumara Biebiel versus Ademu Dramani. And there is one which is ongoing, the Asen one. The High Court has determined it is now to be, um, to be sent to the Court of Appeal to determine in the size of its appellate jurisdiction. If you are a Ghanaian, you can also renounce. That is what we call renunciation of Ghanaian citizenship. You can renounce your citizenship, but you must comply with law. Apart from you renouncing, apart from citizenship by birth, that is the one I took you through together with foundlings. These two, we call them citizenship by birth. Apart from these two, we can deprive you of your citizenship. Why? Why? Because you have naturalized, you have registered, but you are putting up a conduct which is unbecoming. In that sense, the law permits the Attorney General to initiate an action. And please, the action is initiated by the Attorney General. And when it is initiated by the Attorney General, it is filed in the High Court. It is only the High Court that has exclusive original jurisdiction to entertain. When an action is brought to deprive a person who became a Ghanaian by registration or naturalization. So if you are a Ghanaian and you have not been deprived of your citizenship, you cannot be deported. So that is why these uh, cases, the old cases, Balogun and others, versus this and another, Ladan versus Attorney General and others, all these cases, they said they were Ghanaians. They said they were Ghanaians. The matter were pending before the, the, the then High Court. Then, out of the blue, they were deported. So can you deport a Ghanaian? No, you cannot deport a Ghanaian from his own land unless the person is, is first and foremost deprived of his citizenship in accordance with law by the High Court. But if it is citizenship by birth, nobody can deprive you. Because if we deprive you, where do you go? You don't have any place to go. If you have acquired citizenship elsewhere, they can rather deprive you. So this one, uh, uh, the law is that no country can deprive a person who acquires citizenship by birth of his or her nationality in that country. So that is why those who did constitutional history, you talk about Balogun and others, others versus Duse and another, Ladan versus Attorney General and others, Shalabi and another versus Attorney General. All these cases, they were to the fact that they were citizens. They should have deprived them before deporting them, but they did not comply. That is why we, uh, whenever we are talking about um, fundamental human rights in respect of citizens of Ghana, we talk about these cases. We talk about 
these cases. So that is for us chapter four. So we are moving to chapter five. We are moving to chapter five, fundamental human rights and freedoms. Chapter five, fundamental human rights and freedoms. Fundamental human rights and freedoms. When we talk about fundamental human rights, we talk about fundamental human rights. We are talking about inalienable rights. We are talking about inalienable rights. That is right that rights that have been conferred on us by virtue of being of being a human being. Once you are a human being, then that right is given to you. Fundamental human rights. It is given to you by virtue of being one of the human race. So once you are of human race, whether you are a Ghanaian or not, then we must accord you that right. Let me give you a brief background for you to appreciate. I believe you've done it, but being, being revision, let me talk about it briefly. You know, fundamental human rights developed through history, particularly the natural law school, the natural law school, where you have Thomas Aquinas, you have St. Augustine's, then some of the Muslims too, you have Abu Mansur, A Abu Mansur, A Maturidi, and some of them, they propounded fundamental human rights that we were created by God. So once we were created by God, then God has given us some rights that cannot be taken away by any person. That brought about the natural law school. So when the first world war came and most people perished, they died then there was the need to have a document to regret the rights of human beings. So that brought about the first world war, the whole world decided to come together to form a union, to, promote, uh, to protect the right of human beings. Then in the, course of, in the course of time, there came the second world war. So they said, the first world war, 1914 to 1918, they fought. There was this international body which was formed. The international body could not protect human beings. Now, look at what has happened. So the whole world, we must come together. And that brought about the, the, uh, the UN Charter, the, UN, the United Nations Charter, which was formed in 1945. If you read the Charter, it talks about fundamental human rights. The basic thing is that the world had experienced war not less than two times and had brought untold hardship to the people. And for them to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and wealth of human beings, then there was the need to ensure that the UN protects the rights, fundamental human rights of all human beings. Having done so, then they came with a soft law. When we say a soft law, it, it appears to your conscience. It doesn't bind you, but it appears to your conscience that you must, you, even though it doesn't bind you as a force of law, your conscience, must, your conscience must tell you that this is this one should operate. You must give effect to it. That brought about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And if you look at the, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that is the first soft document on fundamental human rights. This is the first document on fundamental human rights. And if you read the preamble, it says that human beings recognize the inherent dignity of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. It is the foundation of freedom, justice, peace in the world. So here we are talking about inherent dignity of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. That is, that, that is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. So we must respect the fundamental human rights of people. We must respect the fundamental human rights of people. So if you look at our chapter five, all the things that we have from chapter five, 
chapter five through, sorry, chapter five, that is from articles 12 through 33. We borrow them from the fundamental human rights. And in Ghana, as I said, the fundamental human rights, the, the investor declaration, it, it is a soft law, but in Ghana, it is a binding instrument because Supreme Court and the courts have quoted almost every provision. Once it is quoted by the Supreme Court or, or by the High Court or Court of Appeal and has not been reversed, it becomes binding. So almost all the provisions have been quoted. So in Ghana, we cannot describe the Universal Declaration as a soft law by virtue of having allowed ourselves to be persuaded and therefore having used them in decided cases. So when we talk about fundamental human rights, here I want to make a small um, distinction for you. When we talk about fundamental human rights, it is the High Court which has jurisdiction to enforce fundamental human rights provisions. Please listen, every court, every court has the right, every court has the right to enforce fundamental human rights provision in a matter before it. Every court has the right to, enfor to enforce fundamental human rights provision in a matter pending before that court. But if you are going to court to enforce it specifically, then it is the high court. For example, the, the right to bail, right to fundamental, right to uh, uh, freedom of movement that, that has brought about bail and other matters. It is a fundamental human right. But if, it, if somebody is arraigned before the district court, there is a matter before the district court. And once it is a fundamental human rights issue before the district court, the district court can enforce it. That is why a district court can entertain matters of bail and determine. It is a fundamental human rights issue. But the question is, if, the, if that court is entertaining a matter and the issue of fundamental human rights issue crop up, then that court has jurisdiction. But if you are going to initiate an action purposely to enforce fundamental human rights provision, that is where the high court has exclusive original jurisdiction. So here we talk about uh, protection of fundamental human rights. The executive, legislature, judiciary, they must enforce it. And all the courts must enforce it. Then protection of right to life. You must protect human beings. But if um, you protect to the extent that you are defending yourself and it is proportionate to the attack, then that's why you have self-defense. If you have self-defense, it is, it is absolute defense. But if... Uh, Provocate, you all know that provocation, intoxication, and all those, they are partial defenses. In, indeed, indeed, when we talk about uh, intoxication, provocation, they are not defenses, but they are defenses only in murder cases to reduce it to manslaughter, and they are even partial defenses. But under Article 13, right to life, everybody must live, but if you are coming to take away my life or to take away my property, and I defend myself proportionately, and you die, it is self-defense. Self-defense is absolute defense. Then protection of personal liberty. Why do we imprison people? Why the court has the power to imprison, even though it is a right. The court may detain you. The court may remand you. Then we talk about respect for human dignity. Respect everybody because we are human beings. As we discussed from the, from the fundamental human rights provision, respect for human dignity. We are human beings and respect everybody. Don't subject any, anybody to torture, inhuman, degrading treatment. Then when it comes to questions of juveniles, I believe you know juvenile. A juvenile is a person under 18 who is in conflict with the law. A person under 18 who is in conflict with the law. So if a person is under 18 years, then the person must be detained. Or when the person is kept in lawful custody, the person shall be separated from adults, shall be separated from adult prisoners. Please, I'm teaching, I'll call you later. They must be separated from adult prisoners. So where somebody is under 18 and somebody is of 18, you cannot arrange them together or you cannot detain them, them together. We don't remand juveniles. We don't imprison juveniles. We detain them, detention. So some of you who, if you read your criminal law and we come to, we come to 
types of punishment. You will see uh, imprisonment, fines, compensation, detention. The detention there, we are not referring to PDA. We are referring to juveniles. Then we have protection from the, sorry, 18. Let me talk about 18 first. Then we talk about eight, um, 17, equality and freedom, no discrimination. Don't discriminate against everybody. Then 18, another important provision. You have a right to own property and you shall not be interfered. You should not interfere with somebody's communication, correspondence, or what other things. When we talk about interference with somebody, it is a fundamental human right. But if it is for other reasons, for example, where it is for uh, criminal purposes, we are being recorded because you are going to uh, do an act which is criminal, which is immoral, which is illegal, and you are recorded. You cannot take refuge under Article 18.1. You cannot take refuge under Article 18.1. The reason is that if you read Article 18.2, it gives exceptions. It gives exceptions to the general rule. It gives exceptions to the general rule. And we have, there are several cases. There are several cases on that aspect of the law. Then, apart from that one, then we move on to fair trial. Fair trial, you have discussed it in criminal law. Please, Article 19 is fair trial. It, it applies to criminal and quasi-criminal trials and not civil trials. Then we move on to protection from deprivation of property. Then general fundamental human rights. There are several cases emanating from those provisions. Then property rights of spouses. Property rights of spouses. Where property is going to apply during marriage, how, how should that property be governed? If it comes to dissolution of marriages, what should be done? Then Article 23, administrative justice. Administrative justice. Where we use administrative bodies to complement the course to determine matters. What are they supposed to observe? And the law says that they must act fairly and reasonably. If you read Awuni versus Waik, Awuni versus Waik, it is on administrative justice. Then economic rights, educational rights, cultural rights, women's rights, children's rights, right of the sick. Then you come to how to enforce them under Article 33. Article 33, how do we enforce fundamental human rights? Fundamental human rights provisions are enforceable by the high court. That means you are going to court purposely for the enforcement of a, of a provision. In that sense, you go to the high court. That was why Bimpombuta versus General Legal Council. It was enforcement of its right. And, who, and if you read Article 33, it says that, a, please hear, listen to, the, we have a person here, but the meaning given to that person is different from the, a person under Article 2. Article 33 one says that where a person alleges that a provision of this constitution on the fundamental human rights and freedom has been, is being, or likely to be contravened in relation to him, if it concerns you, then you go to the High Court. For example, Bimpambuta is General Legal Council. The, the matter that Bimpambuta wanted to enforce, he was one, he was one of the victims. So it's it, it related to him. So once you are one of them, then you must go to high court. You must go to the high court if you are one of them, one of the applicants seeking that remedy. That was why his case was struck out as incompetent. Now, when we come to the enforcement of fundamental human rights, here, a person here means every person. Why do we say that a person here means every person, whether citizen or non-citizen of Ghana? It is fundamental human rights. It is, it is meant for everybody. It is meant for everybody, not for interpretation or enforcement of the constitution. This one, it is an inalienable right. And we are just enforcing the soft law, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So anybody at all can take advantage of Article 33. Anybody at all can take advantage of Article 33, provided it relates to that person. But if you want to take advantage of Article 33, and you are not one of those people to be affected, then you go and you go to the Supreme Court. Please hear, it is very, very important. All fundamental human rights enforcement are made by the High Court. But where 
the aid does not relate to the African and it is of national importance or public nature, such as if you look at a GM for versus AME, where people were carrying a night soil toilets. And he said that no, to him, it violates their fundamental human right. He wasn't one of them. If he, if he were one of them, he would have gone to the high court. If you are not one of them, then you go for enforcement jurisdiction under Article 2. So please, if you are going for the enforcement of the Supreme Enforcement jurisdiction, you are going to invoke the enforcement jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, and it is on fundamental human rights, then it must not, it must not concern the African. If it concerns you, you go to the high court. If it is of public interest and you are not one of them, that is where you go to the Supreme Court for its enforcement. And in that sense, Supreme Court has exclusive original jurisdiction. The Supreme Court has exclusive original jurisdiction. Now let's talk about Article 11, sources of law. Please, when we talk about sources of law, they have not been arranged in hierarchical order. They have not been arranged in hierarchical order. What we have under Article 11, they are what we call primary sources of law. Primary sources of law. And the primary sources of law, we have the constitution. Then we have enactments made by or under the authority of parliament established by this constitution. Here, parliament can sponsor its own bill and come out with an act or private persons may sponsor a bill. Now, now we've heard about the LGBTI bill, which is being sponsored by, by private persons. So here we are talking about it wasn't in, made by parliament. It was made under the authority of parliament. That is why if you read Article 12b, in that, 11b, sorry, enactments made by or under the authority of parliament. Then the third one, we talk about orders, rules, and regulations. When we talk about orders, rules, and regulations, we are talking about delegated legislations or subsidiary, subsidiary legislation. They are the same, delegated, subsidiary, or subordinate legislations, which we call the CIs and the LIs. Please bear in mind, ye are executive instrument hasn't got legislative power. Executive instrument cannot exist in orders, rules, and regulations because they lack executive, they lack legislative power. They are not laid before parliament for 21 sitting days. Every other rules and regulations, that is CI or LI. Why do we call some of them CI? Why do we call some of them LI? We call some of them CI because they derive their authority from the constitution. If the constitution authorizes a body to come out with a law, not an act, a lower law, to regulate itself, then you derive your source from the constitution. And when you make such a law, you lay it before parliament for 21 sitting days under Article 11, 7, 21 sitting days. And when it matures, if your authority is from the constitution, it becomes CI. If your authority is from an, an act of parliament, it becomes LI, legislative instrument. Now the LIs and the CIs, the law may say that LI or CI in the form of orders, in the form of rules, in the form of regulation. For example, let me refer you to Article 155 seven of the constitution. It talk about rules of court committee. The rules of court committee, the composition is there and they are to make rules by constitutional instruments. They are to make rules by constitutional instrument. That is why the rules of court, if you come to the high court, the high court is regulated by CI. District court is regulated by CI, constitutional instrument, because the rules of court made it under Article 157 of the Constitution. And that is why we say you go to the District Court or High Court. District Court is CI 59, High Court is CI 47, and you say order one, order two, order three. So here it is constitutional instrument, constitutional instrument in the form of orders. But if you come to the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court, Court of Appeal rule CI 19, Supreme Court rule CI 16, they are rules. So when you are quoting CI, you say, rule one, rule two, rule three. So, but if you take the electoral commission into account, 
Electoral Commission is supposed to come out with regulations and they derive their source from the constitution. So when they make CI and you are quoting it, you quote it regression one, regression two, regression three. And if it is CI or LI in the form of orders, rules and regression, and it is not laid before parliament for 21 sitting days, it shall not mature to become a law. It shall not mature. That is Mensa versus Electoral Commission. It used to be Ebenezer A.E. Mensa versus Electoral Commission, but it has been reported in the Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report as Mensa versus Electoral Commission, where Dr. Farijan, in his um, cruising time, when he was supposed to have uh, organized district assembly election, then he filed the, the uh, CI before, the, before parliament. It, it was laid before parliament for 21 days. But that 21 days, parliament has sat for 10 days. And the law says 21 sitting days. So that was why Supreme Court struck it, struck it out as unconstitutional because it did not mature. It matures when it is laid before parliament for 21 sitting days. When parliament does not sit, date does not run. Time runs only, only when parliament sits. When order rules or regulation in the form of either CI or LI is laid before parliament. Now, the, then we talk about number D or four, the existing law. We have several laws in existence. We have several of them before the coming into force of the constitution. We had rules of general, uh, English status of general application. We have the ordinances. Then we have the constituent assembly. Please, whenever you come across the, the law known as CE, constituent assembly, that means they were made between the time Ghana had independence up to the time Ghana had republic. They did that, sorry, the Ghana's independence up to a day before Ghana had its republic. So from 1957 to 6 March 1957 to 30th June 1960, all the laws made, they were made by the Constituent Assembly. That is why we call them CA. Then after the CA, then Ghana had its first Republican constitution. That's where we started with the acts. So when we talk about we talk about existing laws, it includes status of general application, the ordinances, then there's CAs. Then we come to 19, we come to 1960. We have some of the acts which have not been repealed. Then we have delegated legislations under them. Then we have NLC laws. Then we had 1969, some of the acts, including the Citizenship Act, which, which was amended. Then we have the Wars Act. The Wars Act was, was made during the Second Republican Constitution, and it continues to form part of the law. Then we have the Matrimonial Causes Act. All of them were made, and they continue to form part of the law. Then uh, we have NRC, for example, the Evidence Law, the Evi Law on Evidence, the Evidence Act, NRC D-175. It was made during the time of um, General Champong, NRC. So we have all this law up to PNDC type, which are in existence. All these existing law, that is what we call the existing, that is what we call the existing law. So please, that is why we say that Article 11 is not arranged in hierarchical order. So when we talk about the supremacy of the constitution, it is not by Article 11. Because you cannot say that CI is CI is higher than existing law. Can you say that CI is superior to, to the Matrimonial Causes Act, to the Evidence Act? It is impossible. So they have not been arranged in, in, in hierarchical order. Then after the existing law, then we move on to the common law. Please, we have common law and we have common law of Ghana. So the common law of Ghana is made up of three. It's made up of the rules generally known as common law, the rules generally known as equity and customary law, including those determined by the, by the superior cause. So when we talk about sources of law, these are the primary sources of law. These are the primary sources of law in the country. And if you want to arrange them in, in hierarchical order, we have the constitution first, because Article 1 says so. Then all acts of parliament, whether existing or made under the 1992 constitution, all of them come together, acts of parliament. Then, then the third one, orders, rules, and regulations, delegated legislation. And the fourth one is common law. If you want to arrange them in 
in a hierarchical order. That is the arrangement. Now, this is the primary law. Then we have the secondary law. What are these secondary laws? Secondary law, the most important among them is what we call stereo decisis. Stereo decisis. Stereo decisis. Decisions by courts of record. Decisions by courts of records. Then we talk about bylaws. This is assembly bylaws. Then um, this is assembly bylaws, directive directions issued by organizations. That is why the court, when we issue practice direction, it is considered as part of the secondary laws on the land. Some of you who are abreast of the laws on bills, bills, you come across the practice direction issued by the chief justice, under the hand of the chief justice. They are all secondary sources of law and they include textbooks, journals, refereed articles, all of them come under the secondary sources of law. So when you are asked to talk about sources of law, the one in the constitution is the primary source and those I've talked about, they are the secondary sources. So in that sense, you talk about the two, both primary and secondary sources of the law. Having said so, I will discuss one of them, which is very, very important. Stereo decisis, judicial precedent. Judicial precedent. When we talk about judicial precedent, we look at it from two angles. We have binding decisions and persuasive decisions. Binding decisions and persuasive decisions. When we say a decision is binding, a binding decision, that means the court, which is confronted with a matter, is bound by a decision previously delivered in respect of the same subject matter. So let me start from this, even though I shouldn't, but I want you to understand. Please, all foreign cases, all foreign decisions have only persuasive effects on our court. All foreign decisions have only persuasive effect on our courts. So where the Supreme Court of America, the Supreme Court of England, and now they have a Supreme Court, if they deliver a judgment and you come to the Ghanaian court, my Lord, it binds you, it doesn't bind any court in Ghana. It has only persuasive effect on the courts in Ghana. I'm starting from the Supreme Court. At times people get it wrong that Supreme Court is not bound by its own decision. Please listen, number one, Supreme Court is bound by its own previous decision, but it may depart, but it may depart when it appears right to do so. So Supreme Court is normally bound by its own decision. Supreme Court is normally bound by its own decision. When you go read Article 129, when you go read Article 129, Cross three, Supreme Court is not is normally bound by its own decision, but it may depart when it appears it right to do so. Meaning, when Supreme Court is departing from its previous decision, it must assign reason because it is normally binding on it. Then, so whenever Supreme Court gives decision, it binds the Supreme Court itself, but Supreme Court may depart from its own decision when it deems it right to do so. But Supreme Court decision binds all courts below the Supreme Court. And they cannot say they will not depart. They will not follow. All decisions. So when Supreme Court delivers a judgment, it binds the Supreme Court itself, but it may depart. But all other courts, it binds them, and they cannot depart. That is the first one. Then number two. Number two. The High Court, sorry, the Court of Appeal is bound by its own decisions. The Court of Appeal is bound by its own decisions. That is Article 136, Clause 5. When Court of Appeal delivers judgment, it binds the Court of Appeal. When Court of Appeal delivers judgment, it binds the Court of Appeal and all courts below it. But Court of Appeal has only persuasive, a decision by the Court of Appeal has persuasive effect on the Supreme Court. Supreme Court may, may allow itself to be persuaded or not persuaded. So when you write a question of that sort, you must explain that when 
court of appeal delivered judgment. It binds the court of appeal and all courts below it. And that judgment does not bind Supreme Court, but it has only persuasive effect on the Supreme Court. There is an exception here. Whenever court of appeal delivers a decision, a ruling in interlocutory appeals, it doesn't bind the court. Interlocutory decisions of the court of appeal does not bind the court of appeal. There is this case, farmers versus something, something. There are several authorities. Whenever a court of appeal delivers interlocutory decision, it doesn't bind the court of appeal. But whenever a court of appeal delivers a final decision, it binds the court of appeal and all courts below it. Let's move to high court. Whenever the high court delivers judgment, whenever a, a judgment is delivered by the high court, it binds all the lower courts. Decisions of the high court binds all the lower courts, but it doesn't bind the high court. High court decision does not bind the high court, but rather it has persuasive effect on the high court, persuasive effect on the court of appeal, persuasive effect on the, on the Supreme Court. You may allow yourself to be persuaded or you may not allow yourself to be persuaded. That is why we say it has only, it may persuade you. But if I say that, oh, I've seen this high court decision, and I'm a high court judge, I think, I think it's a good decision. I will allow myself to be persuaded. In that sense, it will persuade me. But if I think that it should not persuade me because I disagree, I will say that I will not allow myself, myself to be persuaded. So whenever high court delivers the judgment, it doesn't bind the high court, it doesn't bind the court of appeal, it doesn't bind the Supreme Court. It has only persuasive effect on them, but it binds the lower courts. Then whenever regional tribunal delivers a decision, whenever regional tribunal delivers a judgment, please regional tribunal continue to form part of the laws on the land, even though it has become more urban in practice. In practice, we don't have them, but in, but in the eyes of the law, we, they continue to form part of the laws on the land. So where a regional tribunal delivers a judgment, it doesn't bind, it, it doesn't bind the regional tribunal, but it binds all the lower courts. It, it may persuade the high court, it may persuade the Court of Appeal, it may persuade the Supreme Court. It, it may persuade the regional tribunal itself, but it doesn't bind any one of them. Please, the lower courts are not cause of record. The lower courts are not cause of record and therefore do not create binding nor persuasive decisions. They neither create binding nor persuasive decisions because they are not cause of record. If you look at Article 126, the people of Ghana, through the constitution, created Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, High Court, and Regional Tribunal, and gave power to parliament to go and create lower court. So apart from these four, any court in Ghana is a lower court. So if you go to section 39, section 39 of the, of the Courts Act, that is where parliament took advantage and created lower court. And they created the circuit court, the district court, the juvenile court and the chieftaincy tribunals. And all other courts, such as the military tribunals, the court martial, all of them, they are inferior tribunals. Please, when we are talking in terms of the courts, we call them lower courts and not inferior courts. In 1969, the constitution made them inferior courts. 1979, the constitution made them inferior courts. But the 1992 constitution made them lower courts. The name, it, it is just nomenclature. They are lower courts because their jurisdiction is limited. They are inferior courts because their jurisdiction is limited. Inferiority in terms of jurisdiction and not in terms of those who sit. But in Ghana, people use it derogatory. That was why under the 1992 constitution, they decided not to use the term inferior, but rather use the term lower court. Still, we see, still we see students writing inferior court. If you write inferior court in Ghana, you are wrong. In the UK, they continue to call them inferior court, but the constitution says Article 126. Let me find it and read. Article 126. The judiciary shall consist of the Superior Court of Judicature, the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, the High Court, and the Regional Tribunal. Such lower courts or tribunals as parliament may by law establish. So such lower courts, it did not say such inferior courts. 
Now, for the composition, please read the composition and jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Supreme Court has supervisory jurisdiction over all courts in Ghana. It has, it, it has supervisory jurisdiction over all courts in Ghana. It has appellate jurisdiction from the Court of Appeal. Please listen. Supreme Court has appellate jurisdiction in all matters from the Court of Appeal, with the exception of creation of boundary under Article 46 and creation of boundary and parliamentary election dispute. That one, Court of Appeal has final jurisdiction, final jurisdiction. Apart from these two, any decision from the Court of Appeal is appealable to the Supreme Court. And all appeals from the Judicial Committee of the National House of Chiefs go to the Supreme Court. Then when it comes to the, when it comes to the, um, the High Court, appeals from High Court, all appeals from High Court go to the Court of Appeal with the exception of treason and high treason. Court of Appeal, when, whenever High Court hears matters on treason and high treason, that one you appeal to the Supreme Court. Appeals from High Court in respect of treason and high treason, you appeal to the Supreme Court and not the Court of Appeal. But in all cases, their appeals go to the Court of Appeal. In all cases, the appeals go to the Court of Appeal. Then it has original jurisdiction in parliamentary, sorry, in, in presidential election dispute. It has original jurisdiction in presidential election dispute. After all, you have observed too, so you know. Then when it is um, under Article 135 of the Constitution, production of official documents, production of official documents, it is the Supreme Court that has exclusive original jurisdiction. It is the Supreme Court that has exclusive original jurisdiction. Then in Ghana, it is only the Supreme Court that has reviewed jurisdiction. It is only the Supreme Court which, which can review its own decisions. Please, until recently, the rules of court purported to confer review jurisdictions on the district court, the circuit court, the high court, and the court of appeal. But it has been revoked. CI-134 has revoked the review jurisdiction of the district court. And district court cannot review its decision because the constitution did not provide, the courts did not provide, but rather the rules of court. That is why the rules of court, latter part of last year, decided to revoke because, because, it, because it was not sanctioned by any law. Then when we come to the high court, order 42, which was on review jurisdiction, that one too has been revoked by CI 133. Now high court cannot review its own, own judgment under, under order 42. It has been revoked. Then when you come to the court of appeal, court of appeals jurisdiction to review has been revoked by CI 132. So only the Supreme Court has the power to review its own decision. So Supreme Court has original appellate supervisory and review jurisdiction. So it has these four jurisdiction. But Court of Appeal has only appellate jurisdiction. Court of Appeal has only appellate jurisdiction. Please, as for contempt, every court Every superior court in Ghana has the power to commit for contempt. Once it is against its proceedings or before that court, when it is contempt, it is not original jurisdiction. When it is contempt, contempt of the high court, high court can convict you. Contempt of the regional tribunal, regional tribunal can convict you. Contempt of the court of appeal, the court of appeal can convict you. If you read this case, Republic versus High Court, Kumasi, S. Party, Hansen Kodukudia, Republic versus High Court. Kumasi S Party and Senko 2015 2016 Supreme Court Ghana Law Report. It, now it is unambiguously stated that the jurisdiction to commit for contempt is not original, and any appellate court whose jurisdiction has been abused has the power to commit that person for contempt. So let me talk briefly about. Chapter six, chapter six of the Constitution, Directive Principles of State Policy. Directive Principles of State Policy. Please, when we talk about Directive Principles of State Policy, what is it about? Directive Principles.
principles of state policy means that as spies to attain free states in future. So why are you here? Why are you attending this lecture? Because you want to pass. You want to pass what examination? The entrance examination to what? To the law school to do what? To become a lawyer. So all the objectives that Ghana seeks to achieve, economic, political, social, all of them, that is what we have under chapter six of the constitution, which we call the directive principles of state policy. We have political objectives that in politics we want to achieve. We don't want to have Ghana as a one party state. Then we frown upon coup d'etat. Then make reasonable access to all persons in Ghana to make use of the law. Then let, let everybody observe the fundamental human rights. These are the political objectives we seek to achieve. Then economic objective, fair remuneration, uh, you, um, ensuring that individuals, private sector, then every, uh, development, we develop agriculture. Then people are made happy. Then we guarantee ownership of property and the right of inheritance. All of them come under economic objectives. Then we move on to social objectives. Freedom, equality, probity, accountability. These are the things that we want to achieve. Then we move on to 38 educational, educational objectives. F -keep. Now we have, we have free compulsory basic education. Now we have free HHS. All these are educational objectives that we want to achieve. Then cultural objectives, cultural practices which are obnoxious should be abolished. Then the other customs, we should improve up, upon them to identify our identity, to, to demonstrate our identity. Then 40 is on international relations. We cannot live in isolation. We cannot live in isolation. That is why we are members of the UN, EU, Commonwealth. So we must respect their treaties, any treaty, the aims and objectives of the UN. We must, we must obey them. African uh, unity, ECOWAS, Commonwealth, we must, we must obey all of them. Then 41, if you have good objectives and your citizens are bad people, you will never achieve them. So Article 41 imposes duties of a citizen. Always we talk about our right, enjoyment, our right. What about duties? Pre promote the good name of Ghana, defend the constitution of Ghana. So Honorable Martin Amidu, you saw him going to court quite often in the interest of Ghana. So here, he, he went under Article 41 to uphold and defend this constitution and the law. So uh, these are the things that we have under the directive principles of state policy. But this is not what I want you to understand now. What I want you to understand is that the problem we have with the directive principles of state policy is what is the legal effect of the directive principles of state policy. That is the problem. The legal effect of the directive principles of state policy. Let me walk you through the theory of directive principles. Directive principles of state policy help countries to achieve their objectives that will lead them to free states. So if you want to become a free state and you want to be seen as a developed country, a no more developing or third world country, then you must have your principles. And these are the principles. So we have three approaches. In some jurisdictions, in some jurisdictions, directive principles of state policy are not justiciable, are not justiciable. When we say justiciability, when we say justiciability, justiciable, meaning you can go to court in respect of that matter, justiciability go to court for a determination to be made, period. So where it, is not justice, where it is not justiciable, that means you cannot go to court for a court to assume jurisdiction and make a determination on the matter. Justiciability does not mean you have won, you have lost enforcement. No, it is the ability to go to court for that matter to be determined. So in some jurisdictions, it is justiciable. South Africa, directive principles of state policy, they are meant to be justiciable. So if you read the South African constitution, it is stated black and white that they are justiciable. If you read that of, if you read that of Nigeria, 
that of Liberia, Sierra Leone, Gambia. It is stated black and white that they are not justiciable. But in Ghana, it is not stated whether they are justiciable or not justiciable. The expert who made the constitution proposed that they should not be justiciable. But it was rejected. You know, they are three. If you say that one, one has been proposed, I reject. Are you taking the second or the third? We did not say that one in the constitution. That has brought about why we always examine students on the legal effect of the directive principles of state policy, because we don't know. Now, the first case that came about was on political objectives. Political objectives. So that case was the new patriotic party versus attorney general the new patriotic party versus attorney general, known as the 31st December case, where public fund was to be used to celebrate the achievement of PNDC, which came to power through, through coup d'etat. And MPP went to court that it offends other provisions, including the political objectives of the directive principles of state policy. So the attorney general raised an objection that the directive principles are not justiciable, so you cannot come to court. But the Supreme Court per majority held that the directive principles of state policy are justiciable. There is no provision in the constitution making them not non-justiciable. So the first position that Ghana took was that directive principles of state policy are justiciable. That was in New Patriotic Party versus Attorney General the 31st December coup case. Then there was this second case. There was this second case. New Patriotic Party versus Attorney General, Siba case. New Patriotic Party versus Attorney General, Siba case. What happened in this case was that it was on the economic objective. So Supreme Court went to the, sorry, the MPP went to the Supreme Court for a determination. And the objection was raised that it is not justiciable because that is so everywhere. Then Supreme Court ruled that when they are found in chapter six, they are not by themselves justiciable. You know, the directive principles, you get 99.7 of them in the other part of the constitution. But when they are found in chapter six, they are not meant to be justiciable. So they were described as a missed bag a missed bag. You may have a corn and you, may, and, and, and you may have a granite, a missed bag. So when they are in chapter six, they are not of by themselves justiciable. Meaning when they, you are coming under chapter six, then you cannot come, go under, uh, go under another provision. So Ghana, the three principles, the first case said they are justiciable. The second case is saying that they are not justiciable. If they are found in chapter six. But if they are found in other part of the constitution, then they are justiciable. So we, the recent decision was rendered in the case of Ghana Loto Operators. Ghana Loto Operators versus National Lottery Association. Ghana Loto Operators versus National Lottery Association. In this case, the Supreme Court stated the true position of the law that it is not stated in the constitution, but they are presumptively justiciable. So if you are called upon to explain the directive principles of state policy, you start from MPP's case, the 31st December, that the court held that every provision is justiciable. But the CBA case, it said, no, if they are found in chapter six, they are not by themselves justiciable. But, the recent decision, which is the true position of the law, the directive principles of state policy are presumptively justiciable. They are premised on presumptions. So whenever the presumptions are made, for example, provide, uh, make uh, tertiary education free for everybody. If you do not have money, can you make it? You cannot. So when the nation comes out with budget and we see surplus budget, then you can go to court that, look at this. There's a presumption that we have money. So, so let's make it free. So now, if you are called upon to discuss the directive principles, we are interested in the legal effect. So the position now is that the directive principles are 
presumptively justiciable. Let me talk briefly about, I'm supposed to close at three, but let me talk briefly about presidential and parliamentary election. I'll just spend five, five eight minutes and wind up. In Ghana, we organize public elections and public elections are organized by the Electoral Commission. And we elect presidents. And when we are electing presidents, we all know the, the law, re regretting how, how the president, the form, they fill, they nominate somebody as, as a running mate, then they go to the pool, then the vote is cast. If nobody gets more than 50%, we go for, for a runoff. So assuming that we are going for a runoff, and a party says that I am, I am withdrawing. What will happen? The law still says that we must go for the runoff for that party. For, for that party to get 50, more than 50% vote cast. So it could be 50% plus one person vote. So where, uh, where nobody secures more than 50%, we cannot elect president. If you go three times, we will go. And if one withdraws, it will not automatically be conferred on the other. We will still vote and ensure that the person who comes get 50% plus one vote or 50 plus. Now, where a person is elected and somebody is challenging the, the election, what do we do? If we look at Article 63 of the Constitution, it says that, let's look at it. 64 says, challenging election of the president. The validity of the election of the president may be challenged only by a citizen of Ghana who may present a petition for that purpose to the Supreme Court. So here, Supreme Court has exclusive original jurisdiction. You present to the Supreme Court. But the person here, the person here, the meaning has changed. It says, only by a citizen of Ghana, a citizen of Ghana here now, by virtue of, by virtue of CI 99, by virtue of CI 99. Now, when it comes to parliamentary, sorry, presidential election dispute, it is one of those who lost. If you did not contest, you cannot go. So if you are a presidential candidate and you lost in that election, then you could go. If you were not one of them, you cannot go. So now we can have a loser, against the winner and electoral commission. So now that is the current position by virtue of CI-99. That is the position now. The win, the, a loser or losers against the winner and electoral commission. Now, when it is heard by the Supreme Court, Supreme Court can make several orders. And when do you file presidential election dispute. This, this question is very simple, but at times it seems to be confusing. The law generally is that elections of elections are not so-called elections until they are gazetted. So when there is an election, the newspapers, the, the, the uh, print media, electronic media, you hear them that this one has won. He had this, this one has won, he had them. Please, they are just, they are just potential results. They are not election results. When electoral commission announces, it is not, it is not gazetted. The results takes effect from the day that it is gazetted. So if you want to challenge presidential election dispute, you have 21 days from the day that the results have been, have been gazetted and not the day that the results were declared. The day that the results were gazetted. So if you file before it is gazetted, it is void. It is void. So this one, you've seen several of them. You have, uh, we, we've come across a two for Adoba Wumia and, and others versus NDC and others. If it were now, NDC couldn't have been a party. That was why the amendment came, the CI-99. So if it were now, NDC couldn't have been a party because now it is about persons 
losers, winner, and letter commission. If you are not one of them, you cannot come. Now let's look at parliamentary election dispute. Whenever parliamentary elections are held, as for this one, you must be a Ghanaian, you know. You must be a Ghanaian. If you are a dual citizenship, you cannot. You cannot. You must be a Ghanaian. And if you are a Ghanaian, then there are conditions. Then if you contest and there is a dispute, Article 99 says that you file a petition in the high court. If you file a petition in the high court and somebody is aggrieved by the outcome, the person may appeal to the Supreme Court, and, sorry, Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal is the final court. If you read uh, Woolensee Constituency Election, Zakaria versus Numakan, all these cases are there. Now, the problem is at what point in time can one challenge parliamentary election disputes? At what point in time can one challenge parliamentary election dispute? Please, if you get tired, read Republic versus High Court General Jurisdiction, S Party, Zanito Rawlings. That one is about who is, elig who is eligible and when does the eligibility start? Is it at the party level or when electoral commission issues a writ? that nomination should be filed. And the law is that at the party's level, it is just an intention. But if you pick a form from electoral commission and you contest and, and you submit, that is where you have demonstrated actual intention of becoming a member of parliament. Now, you have contested, you have lost, or you did not contest, you have lost, or somebody has won, you are not comfortable with it, you want to challenge, what do you do? The law says that the results must be gazetted. If the results have not been gazetted, they are not gazetted. If you read the case of Daniba, Daniba versus Electoral Commission and another, Daniba, where uh, the FMs and the newspapers announced the, the results and Daniba ha had lost. It had not been gazetted. Then he filed a petition. Then the High Court dismissed it on the ground that at the time that you, you filed, the petition, there were no results because they, they become results when they are gazetted. So at the time that it was filed, there was no there was no gazetted results and no declaration had been made. So it was declared void. Now we have several cases. If you look at Ofe Ajiman, then the 21 days, the 21 days start from the day that the results are gazetted. And the 21 days. Within the 21 days, you must file your petition. Please listen, it's very, very important. You must file your petition. Then if you file the petition, you are prior to the court within the same 21 days for you to pay cost into the, into, into the register of the court. That assuming at the end of the day, you lose the case and you are unable to pay cost, that amount will be used to pay, to pay cost that will be awarded in favor of the victor. So here, the petition and security for costs must be paid within 20, the 21 days. If, it is, if one of them is paid outside the 21 days or filed outside the 21 days, it is void. If you look at Ofer Ajiman versus Central Commission and ICQ, the security for costs was not paid within 21 days from the date of Gazette, and the whole thing was struck out as incompetent. Then in Ashanti region, in re parliamentary election for Ahafo region north, for Ahafo region north, in the matter of petition by Honorable Richard the Kuyokun Ediyar versus Akosi Ebise and Electoral Commission, it is reported in 2015, 87 Ghana Monthly Journal 17, Court of Appeal, because it is the final court, where the person filed petition within 21 days. Then he filed an application for security for cause. The judge had lost the father and the judge had traveled. And he did not petition the chief justice to assign a judge. At the time that the judge came, the 21 days had lapsed, but the judge granted it, that it was his fault. When the matter went to the court of appeal, the law was that both must be filed, must be granted and filed within 21 days. So the high court did not have jurisdiction to grant extension of time. So the action was declared nor and void. So whenever you are talking about parliamentary election dispute, look at the time that the matter may be filed. 
and people with capacity. That one, we need capacity. We need capacity to file petition. The, the first one is that a person who voted in that election can be challenged. Then the second one is that a person who claimed, he, who claimed to, ha to have a right to be elected at that election, he can also contest. Then the third, a person who alleges to have been a candidate in the election can also. Then the fourth one, a person who claims that he had a right to be nominated as a candidate in the election. Then when it comes to the relief to be granted by the court, the court can say that uh, the petition is void. He may declare that person, uh, val um, the person who won, the court may affirm it, or the court may dismiss the action, or the person, or the court may declare another person as winner. So on the whole, uh, I've exhausted my time, and Dr. Enes Osudapa, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord. I must uh, sincerely say that I have greatly benefited from your exposition, uh, traveling through uh, various areas of our constitutional law from the very fundamentals to uh, specific thematic areas. And if I have uh, benefited, I am very uh, sure that the students who are writing on Tuesday have also greatly benefited. So my Lord, uh, having taken us using the linear approach from the very start right that way, if not because of time, I'm sure you have taken us even to the very last chapter. Respectfully, if we may take five minutes of your time for maybe one or two questions from uh, one or two students before my Lord will continue with your next engagement, which you ought to have started at three. Uh, I don't know if we have the All right. We have the permission. Oh, yes, we can take. Well, oh, yes, I will allow. Uh, please, uh, students, we have a very limited time. And for that matter, we would like you to be very uh, snappy and straightforward, uh, you know, straightforward to the point. If you want to speak, just raise up your hand and then I will allow you to speak. Yeah, so I can see. Uh, so let's give uh, two ladies and two gentlemen so that it's balanced and my Lord can go. Uh, Shalina. Okay. Shalina. Um, hello, sir. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, please, this is Shalina. Please, my yes. question is whether the whole constitution as a whole can be... Um, so if the citizen of Ghana decide that we want to do away with the constitution and we want a new one. Is it possible? Okay. No, you can amend some parts for the portions which are, um, let me take the constitution and tell you the, the, the provisions. We have provisions on amendment. We can amend the constitution but we cannot do away with the entire constitution. Okay, thank you a lot. Uh, then let's take a Chris. Uh, Chris, okay, Chris Han is down. Oh, no, Chris, Andrew. Uh, Chris? So, so if you get and read chapter 25, articles 289, 290, there you can amend, but you cannot change the entire constitution. Hello, Doc. Yeah, Chris, please. Go uh, 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 thank you very much. I would like um, my Lord to explain um, the idea that subsidiary legislation cannot amend a parent legislation. Thank you. When we talk about laws, if we say subsidiary, subsidiary means it's a, means it stays below an act of parliament subsidiary mm. delegated mm. subordinate meaning it is lower to the act of parliament so the mm. constitution empowers parliament to come out with an act then bodies may come out with lesser legislations but they must lay it before parliament so the reason is that even the name suggests that when you talk about subsidiary meaning it is not at par with the main law 
to subsidiary or subordinate. It is subordinate to act of parliament. So when they are in conference, let me give you an example. Act 32 provided, Act 32, the Legal Profession Act, provided that when lawyers complete school, they must do people for six months. Then the LI provided that one year. We said that no, the LI should follow the act. The act was made in 1960. The LI was made in 2018. Even though recent, the law is that once it is subordinate, then it is inferior to an act of parliament. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, my lord. Uh, Rosie, uh, Rosie, I hope you are lady. I'm taking two ladies and one gentleman. Uh, uh, Rosie? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Your Lordship, thank you for your nice exposition. But I want you to enlighten us a little bit about the argument on allegiance and citizenship. Uh, uh, Rosie, just one second. Uh, Chris, Chris, please mute your mic. Uh, mute your mic if you had your pen. Chris, and I want to mute your mic. Thank you. Rosie, continue. Yes, Your Lordship, please. I want a little enlightenment on the various arguments going around about allegiance and citizenship. I want your take on that. Good. You will not appreciate until you read the, the expert report to the Constitution. The expert report to the Constitution, the Constitution at the time that the expert made, they had in mind that if you are not a fully Ghanaian, you cannot hold allegiance to Ghana. And, that, and in that sense, you should not hold other positions. That was why, that was why the constitution did not even, even permit for dual citizenship. But subsequently, the, the constitution was, amend, was amended to permit dual citizenship. So now you have dual, dual, dual citizenship. But the law still owes that once you hold dual citizenship, then you owe allegiance to another country in addition to Ghana. And if you owe allegiance to another country in addition to Ghana, then you should not hold sensitive positions, such as, you know, I can hold dual citizenship because it doesn't apply to the Court of Appeal. It is only, only the Supreme Court. But if you go to the service chiefs, all of them, directors, chief directors, all of them, if you come to even in the army and this, and this uh, analogous uh, uh, bodies, the Air Force and the Navy, colonels and above, because of the sensitive nature. So once you hold a position, and that position has been, has been outlined as one of the sensitive areas that a person holding that office should not owe allegiance to any other country apart from the government of, apart from Ghana, then that person shall not, shall not hold those offices. So here, the confusion is about citizenship and allegiance. The citizenship and allegiance, if you read the expert report, it's, it explains it vividly. The reason is that if you are a citizen, that alone, you owe, you may owe, you may owe dual allegiance, one to Ghana, one to Togo. But we want some people to owe holy allegiance to Ghana to be able to hold particular offices. Uh, then finally, we take Kobna Ameni. Kobna Ameni will be like the last question, and then we say, a big thank you to his lordship okay. and continue. Kovna, many. Um, thank you, Dr. Adapa, for this privilege. And then my lord, thank you so much. Um, please, um, I'm taking you back to citizenship. Um, oh. Now, um, you gave us the types um, by birth, fondling, adoption, registration, and naturalization. Yes. Um, I want to confirm from you if we can also have something like honorary confirmant honorary confirmant as the person being conferred as a citizen may be by the president? No, there is no such power conferred on the president. And once there is no such power, the president cannot confer. Maybe, but the president can give somebody an award, an honor, but not to give somebody honorary citizenship because it is not prescribed, it, it is not prescribed by any law. Before I wind up, doctor, I want to bring the attention to one thing. Rule no, of no, law, no. I should, I should have talked about it, but, but because of time constraint. Very this rule of law is very important thing. But quite often, some time ago, there was a question to some students and they were fumbling. When we talk about rule by law and rule of law, always understand what we mean by Magna Carta, which was signed in 2015 between 
1215 AD. 1215 AD, Magna Carta, 1215 AD. The importance of Magna Carta is that Magna Carta changed rule, rule by law to rule of law because it was a fight between, between the queen and the, the queen, the kings, the monarchs, and the barons, the barons, the dames, and the knights, the archbishops, and the bishops. They fought. It was a real war. So when we talk about rule by law, we are saying that everybody is under the law, except those who are, who, who are managing the law. So the monarchs were above the law. That is why in Ghana, we practice rule of law by virtue of the benefit, benefit we take under the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta, which was signed in 1215 AD, Magna Carta, the Great Charter. It talks about threatens rule of law. The law is supreme. Everybody is under the law, and we must use the law to protect and preserve fundamental human rights. Thank you. Right. So on behalf you, of Lord. our students, uh, your Lordship, uh, sir, Professor Justice Dennis uh, Jay, I would like to express profound gratitude to you for your time, uh, commitment to uh, education of all those who want to become knowledgeable in the law in Ghana, and more so our students who are uh, struggling to get admission to the Ghana School of Law. We have sincerely benefited from your exposition and analysis. And we'd like to invoke God's blessings upon you for the sacrifice and the kindness. We thank you very much for everything that you've done. So student, at 6.30 uh, tonight, we have Tunisi Amuzu Edward from Gimpa Law School. He will be doing some uh, questions and answers on law of contract to do. I'll try and get the, 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 the Microsoft team sorted that before then. So my Lord, thank you very much. And all of you, yeah. thank you very much. You are welcome, my brother. Thank you. <laughs>